Hello and welcome to your lecture on the Meiji Restoration. Um, Japan really hasn't been a huge part of this course as of yet. We've talked about it a little bit in regards to the Tokugawa um, and things like that, but we are going to see some major changes during this time period as Japan made a so huge So what the AP wants you to know is system. that the expansion of the United States and European influence over Tokugawa Japan led to the emergence of Meiji Japan. Um, that seems simplistic, but the Meiji Japan system is going to be the system that's um, going to impact um, World War One and World War Two on a large scale. So we need to understand the internal makings of Meiji Japan in order to understand their imperial pursuit. So what we're looking at is um, the end of isolation for Japan. Japan up to this point has been pretty isolated. They haven't really done a lot of um, trade. They've shut their borders down on purpose. They, during the Tokugawa era, the Japanese had decided that they were uh, more advanced than the Chinese themselves, and as they watched China get taken apart with unequal treaties, they continued to fear that for themselves. And what ended up happening was the United States showed up and said, hey, we want an open door policy with you, we want to be able to trade with you, um, we also want our ship shipwreck sailor back, sailors back, and so as a result of that, we get this new treaty the Treaty of Kanagawa, and basically what this treaty said was that any shipwrecked sailors would be returned to the United States, and the U.S. was allowed to have two ports and a consulate on the Japanese island. A huge amount of people did not, a huge amount of the Japanese were very concerned about this treaty. They felt that it was the beginning of unequal treaties, just like what China was doing, and they could see that China was falling apart as a result of that, between things like the Opium War, and not controlling their own resources, their government was basically falling apart. And so the Japanese were super concerned about that happening to them. Other Europeans also jumped in on this treaty, and uh, Japan lost control of their economics. The Tokugawa government gives over the rights to set tariffs and trade legislation and things of that nature, and people really did not like this. And so we end up with a little bit of a, of a revolution. Um, the Japanese historians call it a restoration of the emperor, and we oust the Tokugawa government, and we end up with the Meiji. So two families, two daimyo families, the Sat and the Cho families, form an alliance in 1863, and they overthrow the Tokugawa government and create a new government where they were restoring the emperor. Um, they use nationali nationalism as a motivation against foreign influences as their kind of um, way to gain popularity amongst the Japanese people. Uh, the Tokugawa system had been working for a very long time, and the problem with what the Japanese citizens were seeing with the Meiji um, restoration was the loss of a huge amount of their norms. Their society was going to change, the whole samurai thing was going away, uh, increase in trade was changing their entire system for economics. So there was a lot of hesitancy amongst the populace of, the Jap uh, of Japan in regards to this restoration. But this nationalism that the Japanese are able to do is very impressive in regards to their propagandizing the population and that propaganda that the Meiji are going to be able to create is going to really create this ultra nationalism for the Japanese which is going to feed the Japanese throughout World War II. So the Meiji Japan government is our is what we call our first modern state in Asia. Why we call it modern is because of these different characteristics. It is strong it had a strong national government. There was a modern government system that was controlling the entire state um, that had a constitution, it was organized, um, and it had a strong military, and the military was based on universal conscription. Conscription means a draft, so every male in Japan would have to serve um, seven years in the military of Japan. Three of those were active, two of those were on reserve, and then the other um, couple of years were done in some type of bureaucratic system. So they also develop a modern education program. The Japanese are going to create the first literate state in Asia. They're going to use Chinese characters to do this, but the Japanese are going to the Japanese are going to become a very literate population, which again is going to help feed that nationalism. It's easy to uh, create unity when you're teaching people how to read. So using a uh, newspaper print before the radio becomes a huge technology um, is super important to creating nationalism, and Japan is really, really good at it. 
Um, we have a very highly urbanized society within Japan. The cities were developing on a large scale, and to this day, the Japanese have kind of crunched themselves into these major cities like Tokyo. Um, they have millions of people living in very small spaces, and that um, actually impacts a lot of their ways of life. They do create a um, currency, they create a money economy, they're no longer depending on barter, and this is something that took a long time for Japan to go into. The Japanese were very dependent on rice kind of as a currency and a bartering type of system for their basic needs. Well, the Japanese are going to industrialize and they're going to create a currency, and that currency is actually very strong. Um, they are going to invest heavily in industrialization and they have a huge amount of food production that's going to meet the needs of their population. And we see a huge growing population for the Japanese during this time period, where in the previous time period the Japanese were controlling their population uh, growth a little bit more carefully. During this time period, they need um, more men for their military, so um, more Jap citizens was uh, encouraged. Uh, there was a lot more baby making going on um, for the purpose of fulfilling the Japanese army, which is also going to push the Japanese off the island and start um, into the mainland Asian areas, which is going to again create World War One and World War Two issues. The Meiji Constitution uh, was bestowed upon the people of Japan on February 11th of 1889. So just the whole attitude, the propaganda associated with the emperor giving this gift of a constitution to the people. Uh, this is something that's very different than what we've seen in the Western world, where the people have demanded a constitution, where the people have demanded a bill of rights and equality under the law and things like that throughout this time period. We've looked at all of those isms. We've looked at all those political changes that came out of the Enlightenment. Well, this is very, very different. Those ideas have not reached the Japanese people. And so the central government is able to control um, their people a little bit easier by using these ideas of like the, the emperor is giving them a gift of government and that the emperor is a father-like figure. It's a really smart way, again, to create unity amongst the people. Uh, remember, when you're coming out of a feudal system, like what the um, Japanese were still kind of in with the Tokugawa government, you have a lot of work to do to create a Japanese nationalist um, ideology to make the people Japanese, rather than loyalty to their local daimyo, or using the samurai as like warlike heroes, or anything like that, they have to find a way to create um, a, a, to get people behind this new government. And the image of the emperor as a father-like figure was very important to this idea. Um, the emperor was seen as sacred, and he was also seen as a direct descendant of the gods. So believe it or not, there's still this idea of a divine right monarch, but in this sense, um, he is allowing the people this constitution. Um, he was allowed to basically make up laws through imperial ordinances and through executive acts, however he wanted, and he could issue any type of emergency laws. These emergency laws are going to be super important. His power is going to be super important um, through World War II. They did have a legislative assembly. It was called the Diet. It was a bicameral house, just like what the United States has with the House of Peers and House of Representatives. The House of Peers members would serve for seven years. And these were, um, the House of Peers were your old aristocrats. We, these were the daimyo families that had been in charge of Japan throughout all of its history. Um, these were these the old aristocracy and they uh, were handpicked by the emperor, and so you still have a little bit of that, you have to please the monarch kind of idea going on, very, you know, Louis the Fourteenth or Peter the Great, um, but in this sense, your what the Magi government did was they kind of created this um, interesting mix between this idea of democracy, but still holding on to the to absolute power, which is pretty impressive for this time period. Some of the peers were appointed by life, um, for life, and they were appointed by the emperor, so the emperor was really handpicking everybody in the peer level of the legislative assembly, which means that you're going to do what the emperor wants you to do. Um, a lot of the votes and things like that within the House of Peers were run by the emperor. They weren't necessarily very independent of what the emperor wanted. Now, the House of Representatives was uh, filled with elected males, 
you had to be over the age of 25, and you had to be able to pay an annual tax of over 15 yen. Uh, that was a land tax, so basically you still had to own land in order to gain office in the House of Representatives. So this is something very similar to the British system. Um, it took a long time for the House of Commons in Great Britain to be uh, open to anybody who could run. Um, the idea of owning land was still prevalent within the House of Commons for a really long time, and it, and it will remain that way in Japan as well with this House of Representatives. Um, any statute or law that came to the diet floor had to have a majority vote, but the emperor could veto whenever he wanted, and oftentimes he did veto. Another board that was created during out of the Meiji Constitution was this Privy Council. The Privy Council was 26 men selected by the Emperor. Um, there was a Prime Minister. Um, the Prime Minister was chosen by the Emperor with the advice of the Privy Council, and then the men on the Privy Council were chosen by the Prime Minister and the um, um, and the Emperor. Um, and so you can see that there's kind of this good old boy network where uh, it was the same people over and over again. It was the same families over and over again. So it's somewhat of a corrupt system. Now the Privy Council is really just very similar to our cabinet. Um, they're advisors. Um, they are there to help the emperor make decisions. They're experts in their field. Um, this Privy Council will become more and more military as we get closer to World War II. Uh, the Meiji Constitution did have a small Bill of Rights, but that Bill of Rights could be changed by law. There is nothing in this Constitution that guarantees anything like what we have in our Bill of Rights. The idea of a justice system isn't there, the idea of trial by jury, the idea of um, carrying weapons, the idea of free speech, none of that is protected by this Constitution. This is a very different Constitution than what the United States has. This Constitution was really there just meant to outline this is what our government will be. Um, it did not really set the laws or anything like that into place. You also cannot amend this Constitution. It's not like the U.S. Constitution. So what the Meiji did was they set up a government, and then that government created the laws as they dealt with situations that came up. So it was um, a very fluid type of government where, but again, all of the power was at the top. And so like I was saying, it, it's created this interesting hybrid between um, democracy and still absolute power. Because the emperor at the end of the day really was running the show, and you had so much... Um, people influencing each other and not wanting to make the emperor mad and then holding on to family alliances and things like that that was still going on but under but the people the citizens really felt that they had this new democracy so they still had the structure of the family in regards to this the idea of the emperor as a father very confucian type of government ideals um, it was, again, not something like a pure democracy where the citizens' rights were being protected. It was really about the formation of the government. Um, the idea is that government by men was still better than government by law. So men still knew better and that they should be able to adopt and change and adopt new laws and adapt those laws in order to fit the needs of the people at any given time. Um, the group was still more important than the individual, so the well-being of the national state was more important than the individual human. That is something that's totally opposite in the United States. In the United States, the purpose of our Constitution is to protect the individual. Um, the group dynamic is usually used to make changes. However, that idea of um, the group being more important than the in individual is not something that we really promote here in the United States. Um, man was created unequally, um, that there were, you know, sacred, um, the emperor was sacred, the emperor was a divine being, um, that there were people who were uh, meant to be above others. Uh, that's something that obviously is totally against what the United States was promoting. And eventually law codes were created, criminal law codes, civil law codes, and commercial law codes, but it took years to create this system. So like I was saying, the Constitution was really an outline of, hey, here's our, how our government's going to run, now let's actually run it. So it took a long time for the, for the Diet and for the Emperor to create their law codes. 
the military becomes super, super important for Meiji Japan. Um, the Constitution didn't really have any rules or regulations on how to run the daily system, and so the emperor created a massive bureaucracy. So this bureaucracy had 10 departments, um, you know, just like we have the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of whatever. Um, that's basically the, the same idea. However, what eventually happened, all of the heads of the department became generals. Um, as we get closer to World War II, the entire government system, everybody at the top of the Japanese government, is going to really be involved in the military. And Japan becomes this massive nationalist military machine. And that's why they're so successful at um, beating the Russians in, in 1905, and why they're so su actually really successful in World War II. Um, an example of one of these generals is Yamagata um, Artin. Artomo. He um, did made some major changes for the Japanese military in regards to westernizing it. He went on a world tour and looked at all of the militaries and the Japanese chose the German style of military um, formations and drilling and organization and weapons and things like that. Obviously a good choice considering Germany will start both World War One and World War II. Um, and so the Japanese military was modeled after this amazing German military. So keep that in mind as we go through World War II. Um, he is going to introduce Western weaponry, and he alone will actually serve as Prime Minister for three separate times. So you can see how as we get closer to World War II, Japan just got more and more militaristic as we went. Economics, um, they needed to industrialize. So they focus on specific industries. Remember, Japan doesn't have a huge amount of natural resources. They're land poor. Um, their land is not very arable. It's volcanic rock, so things are difficult to grow there. But they were able to grow cotton on a large scale, um, and they're going to mechanize the cotton industry. They also focus on paper mills, chemical uh, fertilizers, electricity, because they have water. Um, so they can do a lot of hydroelectric power. And in fact, uh, Japan's today is one of the leading uh, powers in regard to nuclear power uh, research and alternative um, power sources is something that the Japanese are researching on a large scale as well. They, are, they also have plenty of coal and steel. Um, they did sugar refining. They didn't grow the sugar, but they did refine it. Um, so they did the processing of sugar, so they would import that from Latin America. Um, and again, the United States is heavily involved in this trade as well. And then, of course, they actually make machine tools. So they industrialize industry. So they make... Um, tools that are going to be used in the factories in China, in the factories in Russia, in the factories in Europe. Um, so they found their niche in regards to economics, and the problem is they didn't have a class with a lot of money. You had the daimyo, but they had pretty much lost money. There was a feudal system. There wasn't actually capital. There wasn't actually cash on hand to build these factories and create these systems. So the government had to pay for it. Um, they, uh, they did not have like a... A, they don't have a capitalist group and so the government creates this group through subsidies um, they had they did pay for a lot of programs directly especially things like the electricity um, and cotton industry but they also did subsidize private industries because Japan did believe in capitalism as their economic policy um, and but they do have to nationalize some of their industries they did have to control some of their industries uh, the way that they help private industries, they had low interest rates, they set up model factories so that other uh, people could learn how to create their own factories. Um, they did um, bring in technical advisors from the Western world. Uh, many U.S. industrialists and entrepreneurs spent a lot of time in, uh, in Japan. But on a large scale, they really imported people from Britain to come over and teach them how to make their factories. Uh, they didn't allow foreign investment, and this is something that the Chinese did not do, and actually, believe it or not, the Russians did not do. They funded everything themselves. The Meiji government operated at a deficit for the first 15, 20 years of its ex it existence. Um, they, they believed in deficit spending in order, in the long run, to industrialize their country, which, if you look at Japan today, was a smart move. Um, the Japanese have been very good with their economy. Of course, we helped them rebuild their economy after we blew them up. But, um, and they, like I said, they use limited foreign advisors, and they really figured out a lot of their stuff on their own, which, you know, can translate into what Japan is doing today. Um, 
one of the things that they did was they created these systems called Zaibatsus. And Zaibatsus is um, a, a company with government ties. So the owners of the Zaibatsu, I uh, believe it or not, Mitsubishi is a Zaibatsu, Sony is, a, uh, is an old Zaibatsu. Um, they basically had these amazing relationships with the government in order to continue their economic well-being. Um, capitalist groups throughout this economic transition remained very small, um, but there was a small middle class developing, and that middle class is going to become very, very Western in their attitudes and their dress and their culture. Um, but there, the majority of the Japanese were still going to be peasants. Remember that when the Meiji Restoration really starts, there's upper class and aristocracy, and then everybody else. There's not a middle class. They weren't trading, they weren't making anything. It was subsistence farming, and then the rich people. That's really all there was. So as in the industry expands, as with any industri industrial revolution, you're going to develop a middle class. Um, and there is some urbanization early on, and then of course the real urbanization takes place after World War II. Agriculture is still the main source of wealth for the Japanese. Um, the peasants were given land during this time period. Um, they had to deal with how to, how to get their agriculture going and how to protect it. Um, most uh, families were given two acres of land. However, all the farming was un, uh, mechanized. So there's no industrialization when it comes to farming for Japan. Jap Japan did not, the Japanese government did not invest, invest in this sector of their government. Um, they, most families consumed about a third of what they grew and then the rest of it was for sale. Um, which again, the fact that they are not necessarily creating a large middle class and their working class is slow to develop, um, they're going to, their agriculture, their, their peasant class is going to remain large. Daimyo were given government bonds to compensate for their lost lands, and so a lot of the daimyo are going to use that money to create their zaibatsu and their factories. Um, there was a 3% land tax, which paid for 80% of the government, government revenue for about the 15, first 15 years of the Meiji. Um, the government was not getting money from tariffs and trade and things like that. Um, it was very, very long process for them to be able to start the government to make profit from their industrialization. However, this land tax was at a fixed rate, which is fine during times of wealth, but if there was a drought or a bad farming year, the peasants still had to pay 3%. And so that did cause uh, difficulty for that lower class. They had, there were years where it was very difficult for the peasants to make their um, tax payments. As far as society goes, the government, like I said, encouraged education and actually encouraged study abroad. Um, they created a Ministry of Education in 1871 and they created a universal education plan. Um, and they trained thousands and thousands of teachers in order to put this universal education plan in place. And they built schoolhouses all over the country. So every single Japanese citizen had six years of primary school. What you were taught during those six years of primary school was uh, basic math and reading. Um, so again, they create this massively literate population. Girls could go on to middle school for about five years if they wanted to, um, if they could. So we will see that increase as the middle class increases as industrialization spreads. Um, boys will go to middle school for sure. Um, and then they would go on to a three-year high school program. At that point, if you were um, going to, at this point for boys, you really kind of were set on what career track you were going to go. Um, there is a little bit of social movement here, especially for men. Uh, women were pretty much stuck, but for men, they could um, possibly, if, if there was a peasant who happened to be super smart and was doing very well in primary school, he would go into the middle school and he could get into the university system. Uh, you would go into the university, university system for about three years. If you wanted to go into medicine, you would go for four years. Everyone was taught to read. Um, this will create massive newspaper print in Japan. Um, Japan is very well known for their newspaper print. Um, and this will help create that nationalism that I've been talking about. Um, the goal was to create competent citizens, not equal citizens. It's not about that. It's about making sure that everybody can read and write, making sure that people are capable of um, competing with the new modern world, but it was not meant to create equality at all. That is not a goal of the Japanese government. That's not something that's in their ideology whatsoever. 
Japanese nationalism, what they do is they go back, they, um, Buddhism had pretty much, and Buddhism and Confucianism are both ideologies that had shown up in Japan throughout the previous time periods. Shinto was still in existence, but what they do is they use Shinto and kind of revitalize that Shinto belief system. Um, other religions were tolerated, but um, the government's going to expand on this Shinto and the idea of uh, native Japanese belief systems and native Japanese culture to kind of get rid of those Western influences and those Chinese influences. And part of that nationalism and part of that propaganda is the idea that the Chinese were taken over by the Europeans and the Europeans were awful to them and so we don't want to be Chinese and so you want to get rid of those Chinese ideas. The emperor is obviously going to be worshipped throughout this system and um, there isn't a god figure in Shinto and so the emperor kind of provides that place, that placeholder for the Japanese to worship. Um, and they are going to use the, the emperor as a way to uh, create unity against all foreigners, Western and Chinese. Um, the, I, their kind of main mantra is revere the emperor, expel the barbarians. So anybody who was white was considered a barbarian. Um, anybody who was Chinese is also considered a barbarian. As far as society, westernization is going to prevail for them in regards to clothing, um, the style of clothing. The Japanese businessmen all wore the western style suits. Um, kimono and traditional Japanese dress became um, something to use for ceremony or for parties. Um, it became a um, the you know the kimono became this a, a national symbol of Japanese culture, but you only wore it for specific occasions. Um, you didn't wear it in your daily life. You wanted to present yourself more as a Westerner, more as a uh, equal businessman with the British or the Americans. Um, they do, they did adopt the Japanese did adopt our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, and the idea of the uh, Gregorian work week. Um, the idea that there were five days in a week and you would have two days off. The weekend um, becomes an idea more in the post-World War II era. Um, up into World War II, you would have Sunday off. Um, obviously, there's no reason in Japanese society to have Sunday off, but that's kind of what they they went with because that's what we were doing. Um, socialism and Christianity will be adopted in Meiji society on a very small scale, um, but again, that idea of equality is something that's not Japanese. Um, the idea of social equality or gender equality is not something that the Japanese... Um, really embraced and though that socialism is not going to catch on neither is Christianity because Christianity also equalizes people it's not something that the Japanese people really embrace or even want um, obviously Meiji society is still very patriarchal very st very class oriented as far as foreign relations go the Meiji led Japan to be an imperialist nation um, they were imperialistic just as much as the British were just as much as the US were uh, they eliminated unequal tre treaties with the Western nations as they industrialized, so there's no longer, eventually the Meiji gain control over their rights to control their tariffs and their trade, um, and they decide that they need to deal with Korea. Part of the reason why they want to deal with Korea is because geographically it's super close to Japan, and the Qing Dynasty had, you know, the Chinese had controlled Korea on and off throughout history, and the Qing Dynasty was holding on to Korea, and what the Japanese wanted to do was to create an independent Korea. Now, whether the creating that independent Korea was meant to be a buffer state or whether it was meant to weaken China is still a little unclear. Um, but either way, it's, it's good foreign policy for the Japanese. So um, there's a first Sino-Japanese war that broke out in 1894. In this war, the Chinese were completely destroyed by the Japanese. Um, and Ch Japan basically controls the Korean independent nation. So Japan helps Korea become an independent country. Um, and Korea really owes their existence to the Japanese. And so this kind of relationship develops between them that's super important. The other part that's going on with uh, foreign relations is Russia. Russia is showing up more and more in, the, in, in Asia as a force to be dealt with, especially as Russians built the Trans-Siberian Railway and they're industrializing places like Vladivostok and they're industrializing their, um, their eastern areas in Siberia and all that kind of stuff. And so the Japanese feel threatened by the Russians. The Russians were the defeaters of Napoleon. The Russian Empire was, um, was a hugely important and valued empire and seen as a ridiculously powerful empire. 
They were fighting over some territory um, and Manchuko, which um, there's a map on the next slide, which I'll show you. But so we end up with a war that broke out in 1904. We call this the Russo-Japanese War. It only lasted a year and Russia was easily defeated. Now this is a huge sign for Europe as well. Russia was defeated. The defeaters of Napoleon's were defeated by these new Asian fighters who had just learned how to use guns. This is huge in global politics. Um, the Europeans all of a sudden don't see Russia as a threat anymore. Um, the Europeans as a whole don't see Russia as strong anymore. And it's showing the weakness of the monarchy in Russia. The Russo-Japanese War will also impact the revolution, the communist revolution in Russia, because the citizens of Russia um, uh, see the, the king, the monarch, the czar, losing this war against this upstart country called Japan. Um, so there's huge political issues um, in regards to the Russians losing this war. For Japan, all of a sudden Japan is shown as a power. Japan is a force to be reckoned with. Um, they have been taking over islands in the Pacific for a couple decades at this point. The United States was really the only global country that was like, hey, we need to watch Japan. Japan's super powerful, we need to be concerned. Um, this is when the Americans started to limit our um, entrance of Asians into the United States. Um, ultimately, we will create the Japanese internment camps during World War II. But prior to that, we started a um, Asian racist program, racism program with our immigration. Um, we were not allowing, which Mr. McDowell covered in his global migration lecture. Part of the reason why we put in the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which actually involved all Asians, we just called it the Chinese Exclusion Act, was because we were scared of the Japanese. And that fear of the Japanese is going to um, disappear during World War I, but that gives the Japanese an opportunity, um, which I'll talk about in just a second. But obviously when World War II starts, one of the whole reasons why we get involved in World War II is because the Japanese Emperor makes an alliance with Hitler. We know that Japan is a force to be reckoned with. Um, we know that Japan is something that can be dangerous. Uh, and so that's why we go after Hawaii, that's why we go after Guam, that's why we're imperializing the Pacific Islands, is because we are watching Japan. To this day, there are hundreds and hundreds of subs um, in the Sea of Japan and over in the Pacific where we're watching our Asian friends. Um, and we started that policy uh, here during this time period where we were watching Japan. Um, we were uh, we set up massive bases on Japan um, in Okinawa. If you've seen Karate Kid, the old Karate Kid, um, you can see the impacts of that um, in Okinawa. But we were we were definitely concerned about Japan early early on, and we were one of the only countries to say, "Hey, we need to watch this country." What you're looking at here is a map of Asia. And what we need to focus on is the expansion of Japan in, in its imperial pursuits. So Japan proper are these four islands right here. And you can see that their first stop that they're going to be concerned about is Korea. Mm -hmm. um, they're super close to the Kore Korean Peninsula. This territory, this, air, this waterway is actually a very short distance. And so you can see why Japan would be concerned about Korea within the first Sino-Japanese War, which was in 1894-1895. The Japanese are successful at defeating the Chap the the Japanese are successful at defeating the Chinese, and as a result, Korea will remain an independent nation until 1910. Japan will take control of Korea officially in 1910, um, and Korea becomes basically a state of Japan. You can see before that that the Japanese were taking over island nations um, already. So you can see they were expanding into Okinawa, they expanded down into Taiwan, um, they're going to expand into Iwo Jima, and um, down through these islands here into the Wake Islands, and then of course in 1920 they're going to gain a huge amount of land here. Now, something to note is that the United States is going to take over the Philippine Islands in 1898 as a result of the Spanish-American War. Well, it makes sense that we would do that, especially when Japan had just taken over Taiwan in 1895. The United States was very concerned about Japanese imperialism. We were very concerned about their expansion as a whole. Now, when dealing with Russia, we're really talking about this peninsula up here. You can see that in 1905, as a result of the Russo-Japanese War, that they were going that they split the um, the peninsula with the Russians, and so the Japanese are going to control this bottom part. The reason why the Russians are even interested in this territory is that at this point they have the the Trans-Siberian Railway has been built all the way down to the city of Vladivostok. This port city is hugely important to Russia even to this day. It's their access to the Pacific Ocean and obviously with American consumerism you need to have a way to get your goods to the United States. 
Um, so this is where uh, Vladivostok is going to become important, and the Russians are going to challenge the Japanese on several occasions and lose again and again and again. And one territory that's going to become hugely important is Manchukuo. Manchukuo is Manchuria. Um, the Japanese rename it Manchukuo when they take over in 1931. Uh, this territory right here is really the cause for the Japanese involvement in World War II. The Japanese are going to in, to have a second Sino-Japanese War in the late 1920s and into the 1930s, which creates their holding of all of this territory, down into even the capital city of, of Peking, which was is Beijing. So this territory, all, all along the coastal region and into um, Outer Mongolia and up into this Russian land, is going to create World War II for the Japanese. Um, and it, one of the reasons why the Japanese are going to ally with Germany is because the Germans are controlling this northern area of China on a large scale. There's lots of minerals there and other resources that the, that the Germans need. And so it would make sense that they're going to ally with the, the Japanese are going to ally with Germany as the Japanese continue to move further south into China. What allows the Japanese into this territory in 1910 and into 1930s and all that is that the Europeans are going to leave China on a large scale. When World War I starts, the, the Europeans are going to pull their troops out of all of these port cities and take them home in order to fight World War I. That gives Japan a huge opportunity to jump, jump over to the mainland and take over all these port cities and all of this territory in the north. And again, the United States was very concerned about this, why we took over the Philippines, why we have today, we even have um, our bases in Okinawa, is because of this fear of the Japanese, which will manifest itself into World War II. So please keep this map in mind as we go through the rest of the course. Um, as we get into World War I and World War II, this area becomes really, really important. The Japanese, this little tiny island nation, becomes unbelievably power and a force to be reckoned with throughout um, the next couple of um, events. So please keep that in mind. I hope you enjoyed um, your lecture on Japan. Have a good day.